Hello, I'm Roger Rush, Minister for the Sixth and Washington Streets Church of Christ in Marietta, Ohio, and I'll be leading our study today. We're glad you've joined us, and we hope you'll stay with us for the next several minutes as we begin an examination of the Gospel of Mark. In our first lesson last week, I provided you introductory material to the Gospel leading up to the beginning of a study of the text itself. I want to encourage you to get your Bible at this time, open it to Mark chapter 1, and be prepared to follow along as we read the text together. As you're doing that, I will tell you that we are now meeting on the corner of 6th and Washington Streets on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We're taking all the precautions necessary to provide for a safe environment. We're urging people who are ill to stay at home and advising those who are uneasy to also stay at home at this time. I should mention that we're meeting on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., taking the same precautions and offering the same advice relative to assemblies. We'd be happy to have you join us at that time as well if you would like to do that. Keep that in mind, and now let's begin our study with the reading of the first eight verses of Mark chapter 1. Would you follow along? Here is what Mark writes. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At the outset, it's significant to me that Mark begins his gospel with the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Unlike Matthew and Luke, there is no genealogical record nor any account of the birth of our Lord. Unlike John, when Mark goes to the beginning, he goes to the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, not to the pre-incarnate Christ as John begins his gospel in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. It's a contrast, I grant you, but an excellent place to begin as you make a record, a very abbreviated record of that, of the life and ministry of the one he styled, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. This is the beginning of the gospel. The word in Greek is euangelion. It literally means the good news about Jesus. Jesus means Savior. And if you didn't know, Jesus is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Joshua. The names are actually identical in meaning. Jesus the Savior is also the Christ. The word Christ, Christos, is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah. In the Old Testament, kings, prophets, and priests were all anointed. In the person of Jesus, we find the King of kings and Lord of lords. We find our great high priest, not after the Arianic order, but after the order of Melchizedek, as the Hebrews epistle establishes. And we find the last of God's great prophets, superior to all others, in the person of his son, as Hebrews 1 underscores. So he is in every sense truly the Christ, God's anointed. His arrival on the scene in the beginning of his ministry is not accidental, nor is it accidental that one came before him preparing the way. Mark cites a passage, in fact, he cites from two prophets, identifying the better known of the two, Isaiah, and saying, Behold, I send my messenger before you, the face of one uh, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. 
What we have in verses 2 and 3 are the joining of prophecies from Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, 1, and Malachi 4, 5. They depict one who would be the forerunner of Jesus, who would come preparing the way for Christ. We know that one to be John the baptizer, and in verse 5, Mark introduces us to John. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, Mark's account of John's arrival on the scene and the preparatory work that he's doing in preparation for the advent of the Messiah and his ministry, that of Jesus, is very abbreviated. But if we look at the full record of the four Gospels, we learn that John was, in fact, the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth. He was a cousin of our Lord, and Jesus identified him in the course of his ministry as the greatest prophet born among women, and yet he said, he that is least in the kingdom will be greater than John. Well, John lived and died before the kingdom was ever established. He saw the coming of the kingdom uh, in the future, but did not leave, live to see it actually established. He was a man of great courage, conviction, and character, and he knew his place. He was not the Messiah. He was not that prophet that was uh, depicted in Deuteronomy 18.15 as coming, and he certainly wasn't in the literal sense Elijah, though Jesus said he was the Elijah that was to come and be the forerunner of the Christ. He came preaching in the wilderness the message of baptism, uh, the message of repentance. Uh, the message of one coming after him who was greater than he. On one occasion, as recorded in John's gospel, John says that John the baptizer or John the immerser said of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. John appeared, the fulfillment of this prophecy as the messenger who prepares the way, who makes straight the path for the coming Messiah. His message was, as the text says here, a message of baptism based on repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The text says that all Judea and Jerusalem came out into the wilderness to the Jordan to be baptized of John. Now, of course, the language is not to be taken literally here. Mark is speaking in a sense with a hyperbole, saying that in essence, the masses came, not every single soul, but multitudes of people came out into the wilderness to hear John's message and were baptized by him. John's attraction was not how he dressed or how he lived, but how faithfully and boldly he proclaimed the Word of God. He is described here as one who wore the coarse camel hair coat uh, and had a leather belt tied around his waist. His diet was locusts, we would say today grasshoppers. Typically, they would tear the legs and wings off of a grasshopper and roast the carcass and eat it. And he, he lived essentially on a diet of locusts and wild honey. Of course, he's in that region of the world that was described in lieu of the conquest as the land that flows with milk and honey. This would have been the wild honey that was readily available uh, in the countryside of Palestine. Uh, throughout pretty much all of biblical history and served to sustain John during his ministry. He spoke of one who would come after him, the text says in verse 7. And he says, I'm not even worthy to stoop and to unloose the, the sandal from his foot. That, that's how great he is, and I, I'm so lowly in comparison you don't find that kind of humility, frankly, in men all that often. John's really a rare breed in many ways. He knew his place, and though he, he was teaching baptism and baptizing multitudes, he said, the one who comes after me, I have a baptism in water, but he has a baptism with the Holy Spirit uh, that I believe is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, and again, in relationship to Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, but that's a different matter for a different time. According to the record here in 
we believe it to be absolutely accurate that while John is in the wilderness and all Judea and Jerusalem are coming out to him to the Jordan to be baptized of him, that Jesus himself comes on the scene. We pick up now the text in verse 9 and read through verse 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. You remember that he was born in Bethlehem, that he fled with his parents. Well, his parents took him as a babe to Egypt until they learned of Herod's death. But upon returning, they recognized that Archelaus, successor to Herod, might also want Jesus dead. So they went all the way north into Galilee and settled in Nazareth to fulfill the scriptures, in fact. And Jesus is now living in Nazareth, in Galilee, when he is ready to embark upon his ministry. So he comes south from Galilee down to the wilderness near uh, the Jordan where John is baptizing here. And he requests of John that John immerse him in the Jordan. Now, baptism, ladies and gentlemen, is indeed an immersion. The word baptizmos, the noun, baptizo, the verb, literally means to bury, to plunge, uh, to submerge. And when you read about baptism in the New Testament relative to the ministry of John or of Jesus or the early church, it was always an immersion, a burial in water, and I cited a couple of Greek words a moment ago, but I'll tell you, you don't have to be a Greek student to learn this. Just look at Romans 6 or Colossians chapter 2, where baptism is identified as a burial, and you'll understand what it entails. You might also want to read the account of the conversion of the nobleman in Acts 8. They came to water, and the nobleman said to Philip, the evangelist, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? So he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he, Philip, baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that he saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. There really isn't any doubt about what baptism is if we're just faithful to the Scriptures. Jesus was coming to John and requesting that John immerse him. And the record says, And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now, in Matthew's account, we learn that John was reluctant to immerse Jesus, but Jesus persuaded him, saying that it must be done to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus never expected of others what he was unwilling to do himself. When his gospel demands, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, he who believes not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 and 16, the Great Commission. We're following in the footsteps of our Lord when we submit to immersion and are buried in a watery grave and raised to walk in newness of life. Now, his baptism was to fulfill our righteousness. Our baptism is for the remission of sins, to be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And when we are immersed, we're following the example of our Lord and in the process of obeying Him, our sins are being washed away by His blood, and upon our obedience, He adds us to His church. Now, I hasten to add that we learn from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 3, that all of this unfolds when Jesus was about 30. So, so sometime perhaps between the age of 29 and a half and 30 and a half, Jesus embarks on this public ministry that begins here with the baptism in the Jordan at the hands of John the Immerser, the great John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of the Lord, the Messiah. Upon his baptism, he is immediately led of the Spirit into the wilderness where he is tempted or tested. Mark's account is very brief. Verse 12, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, a fuller account of this temptation is found both in Matthew 4 and in Luke chapter 4. In Matthew's account, the first 11 verses of the fourth chapter, you find Jesus being confronted by the devil and responding to the three temptations, which fall, frankly, under the category of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, by saying each time, it is written and quoting from the Old Testament. 
by this means he was able to defeat the devil to overcome each trial, test, or temptation and to come out of the situation stronger than ever. But it took a lot of out, out of him, and Mark includes in his very brief account that the angels came and ministered to him following this encounter, 40 days of fasting in the wilderness and facing the temptations of the devil. Then the ministry of Jesus really gets into full swing. Verse 14 and 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, there's a lot that takes place that is not included in Mark's record here of the beginning of the ministry of Jesus because he merely acknowledges that John was arrested and Jesus is now in Galilee and he's really in full swing relative to his ministry. What we learn elsewhere, particularly in Matthew's gospel, is that John was arrested. John had the audacity to say of a relationship between Herod the king and Herodias, it is not lawful for you to have her. She was, in fact, the brother Philip's wife, and Herod had stolen her away from Philip. They were living in an adulterous relationship, and John didn't hesitate to point that out, so he was arrested. On another occasion, the daughter of Herodias danced before Herod, and he's so enamored that he offers her up to half his kingdom. But her desire was to have, at the direction of her mother, the head of John the Baptist on a, on a charger. And so John was beheaded in Herod's jail, and his ministry came to a close. But his ministry had accomplished everything that it was designed to accomplish. He had prepared the way for Jesus, the Messiah. And now John will be taken out of the way, and Jesus' ministry will be in full swing, beginning here in Mark's record in the region of Galilee. You know that Palestine is generally divided by Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. Galilee in the north, Samaria in the middle, Judea in the south. Galilee is the region to the west of the Sea of Galilee and surrounding the sea. And uh, that's where Nazareth was. And it's in Galilee and Capernaum, a seaport city on the Sea of Galilee, that Jesus makes his home base for his Galilean ministry. And John now uh, is out of the way. Jesus' ministry is in full swing. And so Mark here early in chapter 1 begins to tell us of the things that occurred during this Galilean ministry. Verses 16 through 20. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, farther he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. What we have recorded briefly here is the call of the first four of what would be Jesus' 12 apostles. Peter and Andrew are brothers. The implication clearly is that this is not the first time that Jesus has met them, but this is the specific time when he calls them to ultimately become apostles. They're joined by two other fishermen, James and John, who leave their father with the hired servants and begin their time with Jesus in preparation for the role of becoming fishers of men. Uh, they, too, are not strangers to Jesus. In fact, I think we can make a strong case that James and John were cousins of our Lord, being the sons of Zebedee and Salome, Salome being a sister to Mary, the mother of Jesus. That would make James and John first cousins of our Lord. That might explain why they, along with their mother, felt comfortable approaching Jesus, Matthew chapter 20, and requesting that when he came into his kingdom that they might have uh, the places of honor at his right and left hand. Of course, Jesus' response was, that's not something for me to give 
That's not the way it works. You get to the top by going to the bottom. He that will be greatest must be least in the kingdom. Uh, but I think that's an insight into why they were comfortable making that approach. Of course, doing so alienated them for a very brief time from the other apostles, but uh, the fences were soon mended and they continued to grow and develop and became very instrumental in the growth of the early church. I think we'll wrap up today's study with uh, the record here of his first healing uh, during the ministry in Galilee. Beginning in verse 21, they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. The synagogue developed in the intertestamental period before, uh, between the fall of Jerusalem in, a, in, in B.C. Uh, uh, 586 and uh, the advent of the New Testament. By the New Testament time, synagogues seemed to be everywhere throughout the world that any number of Jewish people uh, have migrated to, where there are 10 men in a, a city, a synagogue could be established, and they're, they're prominent pretty much throughout the known world at that time, and certainly within the region of Canaan, Palestine. So he entered the Sabbath, uh, the synagogue, and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You may recall at the close of the uh, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, uh, the people marveled, for he taught them uh, as one having authority and not as the scribes. They were amazed at his ability and his knowledge and his communication skills. And immediately there was in, in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, verse 24, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. We're not going to spend a great deal of time talking about unclean spirits and demon possession. Simply to say to you that this was a phenomenon that was quite obvious during the ministry of our Lord and for a short time after his ascension. And uh, all of the explanations that are offered in my judgment are, are just conjecture. I can't tell you dogmatically what is involved, but I can tell you with absolute certainty there's a clear distinction between evil spirits, demon possession, and actual illness. That's for reasons that I can't explain. For this particular period of time during the ministry of Jesus, it seems the devil had a freer reign and tended to have a greater impact, I believe, on those whose hearts were more open to darkness and more easily deceived and they're referred to as having unclean spirits or being demon-possessed. They were never any match for our Lord. And if you look at all of the exchanges that occur between our Lord and those who have unclean spirits or are demon-possessed, those demon-possessed people or those with unclean spirits always demonstrated the utmost respect to our Lord as they do in this story, calling Him the Holy One of God. They demonstrate by Jesus' ability to cast them out that his authority is far greater than theirs. And of course, the result of this is that the people who saw what was happening reached that conclusion. They were amazed. How can this be? Uh, he's got a new teaching, one that comes with authority. He just doesn't quote the traditions of men. He takes men back to the word, back to its original intent, and speaks with authority. And then he does things like commanding unclean spirits, and they obey him. We've never seen this before. And so, as we conclude today, Mark simply says, and at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region. Now, what Jesus did and what he said was designed with a specific purpose in mind, to demonstrate his sonship that he was truly the Son of Man and the Son of God, as declared in the very beginning of this gospel, he was Jesus Christ, Jesus Savior, Christ the Messiah, and his message is a message of good news to the world. What he said and what he did gave validity 
to who he was. And these things were done because of his compassion in a desire, desire to demonstrate his power and thus to prove his identity. And the things he did and said accomplished the purposes they were designed to accomplish and his fame spread everywhere as we will learn as we continue to look at the text. In our next study, we will pick it up in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 29. So if you'd like to read ahead, I would encourage you to do that in preparation for that study. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that our time together has been well spent and that you will come from this study have a better, having a better understanding and a better appreciation for who Jesus was, for what he did, and for what he demands of us. Thank you again for joining us. I remind you once more, we do meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. at this time and on the corner of 6th and Washington Streets. And again, on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., we would be delighted to have you join us, taking all the precautions necessary and following all the rules and regulations that we're currently required to operate under. Well, until our next opportunity to share from God's Word, Mark chapter 1, beginning, as I said, in verse 29, uh, we hope that you'll have a pleasant day and uh, that God will continue to bless you as you seek to know and do His will. So until next time, this is Roger Rush for the 6th and Washington Streets Church of Christ wishing you a very pleasant good day.